Miller will be our keynote speaker. Will be our keynote speaker. He is an award-winning speaker and trainer. He is Toastmasters 2005 World Champion of Public Speaking, and he has delivered over 5,000 speeches in over 60 countries on public speaking, leadership, and overcoming failure and adversity. Lance has been an active Toastmaster for 30 years, is a double DTM, and has held nearly all of the club officer positions multiple times. In 1999, he was part of the leadership team that built his home club, Renaissance Speakers, to 95 members and was the number four club in Toastmasters International. He has an extensive business background as well as a venture background from climbing mountains to sailing across oceans to flying across continents. He is the CEO of Terra X LLC providing sustainable products and technology to the agricultural, commercial, industrial, and marine markets. Please help me welcome Lance Miller as he presents his speech, Toastmasters, an International for Success. I'm sorry, an internship for success. I'm sorry. That's okay. That's okay, Karen. Thank you and welcome District 8. I, I have a request to anybody who can. If you can turn your camera on, I'd like to see you. And so the whole idea that we have Toastmaster contest, somebody turns their cameras off, I don't understand that, but uh, I do actually look at you and I wanna have some interaction. So thank you. Thank you for those of you that are doing that. I'm gonna talk for about maybe 30, 40 minutes. We have an hour, is that right, Karen? Okay, and then I, I'd like to have some Q and A. So I'd like to engage and actually see what you want to hear, hear from me. And as I said, this is my first trip to District 8 and it's great to actually meet everybody meet everybody here. As Karen said, I, I've been in Toastmasters 30 years, which is amazing. I never joined Toastmasters to make it part of my life. I just thought it looked like a fun thing to do. And I'll, I'll give you my, my membership building tip. <laughs> Here's how I joined Toastmasters. I had a friend of mine, his name was Glenn Barton, ask me to come to the club. eight times. And uh, it, almost every week I would see Glenn, he would say, oh, you should have been in our Toastmasters club. And he didn't, he didn't say, Lance, you're a horrible speaker. You know, you lack leadership skills. He kept telling me one thing. He said, we had so much fun. Every week, Glenn was so enthusiastic about his Toastmasters meeting and he kept inviting me. And I, the last thing I wanted to do was join an organization that was going to tell me how I needed to communicate. I grew up in a little town in eastern Indiana, and I had five sisters, and I was a middle child. So I was told to shut up for the first 18 years of my life. The last thing I needed were a bunch of people around me telling me how to communicate. But I went to visit the club for two reasons, and one was I was curious what it was Glenn was so excited about every week in telling me stories about this thing called Toastmasters. I'd never heard of it. The second reason I went, and this is the membership building tip, is that I knew Glenn was not going to stop asking me until I went to the club. <laughs> and I wanted him to quit asking me every week to come to the club. So I, I, I dropped by Renaissance speakers. And like probably all of us, I didn't know what Toastmasters was until I experienced it. And then I looked at it and I went, well, this would be a fun thing to do. I, I wanted to become a better speaker. I was doing a little speaking at the time and I thought I was okay, but it looked like a fun thing to do, a fun group of people and a place I could develop my skills. And you know, so I joined my Toastmasters club. Now, I, I think it's interesting for me. What if Glenn had only asked me seven times? I asked myself that question quite often. What if he'd only asked me seven times? Here, I'm part of a group that built one of the most successful clubs in Toastmasters. I'm a world champion of public speaking. I've been to 80 districts and 60 countries around the world. And I, Toastmasters has become an integral part of my life. But more important to that, which is what I want to share with you today, it dramatically changed me and the opportunities that I got in life. And I really want to just start this talk off with this. When I joined Toastmasters, it was never to me about being a great Toastmaster. And a lot of people I've seen get into Toastmasters and they're excited. And then we have a great reward system and things. But I see people trying to do the perfect speech in Toastmasters or, or 
you know, do everything great in Toastmasters, but when they walk out of Toastmasters, I don't see them applying necessarily those Toastmasters skills. As an example, there were a number of people in my club that would speak in the club, but we'd say, we have an opportunity to speak outside the club. And they go, no, oh no, oh no, I'm not going out there. It's like, I came here to be a good speaker in Toastmasters. To me, Toastmasters was about using Toastmasters to be good in life. It wasn't having Toastmasters to be good in Toastmasters. And here was a, we were talking about this before the, before my keynote, <laughs> that this is actually a great place to come in and fail and get burned and just get thrown under the bus or get, you know, run over and make your mistakes because there's no consequences for failure in Toastmasters. And I will tell you personally, from my business experience, there are some pretty serious consequences for failure outside of Toastmasters. I've actually lost some jobs because I didn't handle situations well or messed up handling a client with my communication skills or presentations, didn't get demotions, didn't get, or I didn't get promotion, didn't get promotions that I, that I was hoping I would get because did not display the soft skills that I started to develop and learn in Toastmasters. And when I look back on all the different talks I get to do at districts, just a couple of years ago, I just started doing really this whole talk for me, which is very personal. Because to me, this Toastmasters experience is a place where so we develop the soft skills, which I'm going to get into in just a second. We develop the soft skills so we can be more successful in life. We can get the promotions. We can get the, get the new jobs that we wanted. When I came into Toastmasters, I was... I think I was 33, 33 years old. And I, I had grown up, I said, in Eastern Indiana. My family had a nice family business. It was a milk and ice cream company with, with convenience stores and some restaurants. And that's what I thought I was going to do in my life. My whole life was this little town of about 2,000 people. And it was like, you didn't really have a choice. I was the only boy in the family. And it was like following in the, you know, the family footsteps. And I got into that business and the nepotistic aspects of the business were actually pretty brutal. And um, when I was 26, I scratched my head and I said, I got to get out of here. I got to figure my life out. And I moved to LA, which was about as far away as I could get and still stay in the continental United States. And it was, it was at, you know, at that point, I had to start sort of recreating my life. And I had some really good jobs. I, I worked with the, I was an executive actually with the 1984 Olympic Committee. And that was a fluke that happened, but it happened. And I had a great position there and it was a life-changing experience. I spent a couple of years with Nestle in brand management. I wound up on another fluke, getting a job with a St. Louis company called Anheuser-Busch in sports marketing. And I, I did sports marketing on the West Coast with Anheuser-Busch. So I had some incredible experiences and I sold media nationally for a couple of years. And I was looking for that thing that would give me that fulfillment that I sort of had in my family business. And I went back down and started working in smaller businesses, but I was not getting the career opportunities that I wanted. When I was with the Fortune 50 groups, I wasn't doing, I wasn't getting the promotions I wanted. I, I thought I was a brilliant leader. Found out that I had some things to learn about that. And so when I stumbled into Toastmasters, and this is really the truth, I, to a certain degree, I'd given up on my own success. I'd, I'd certainly gotten into this quasi-apathy thing going, man, I, I guess I'm not going to achieve the things I want in my life. I have to settle down and focus. And, and, and it was really a place that helped restore me to my true abilities that I had. And, and I, I want to give you just a couple other examples. When I was when I was 14, I talked my parents into sending me to the Telluride Mountaineering and Leadership School, which was in Telluride, Colorado. And this was before Telluride was even developed as a ski area. It was just this little mining town in Southern Colorado. And for five weeks, I learned to climb mountains. I slide down snow fields. We rafted rivers. We had to do a 10 day trip through the hike, uh, through the Rockies and navigate with our own topo maps and everything. We had six of us. And I came back and I was going, 14 years old, I'm going leadership school. I didn't think I learned anything about leadership. But when I got, it was my freshman year in high school, I was coming back in and I went, you know, I realized my viewpoint was different than my classmates. The experience that I had. Now, when I was in Indiana, I wasn't climbing anymore. I wasn't sliming, climbing down, sliding down snow fields. I wasn't rafting rivers in Indiana, but I had gained skills 
that summer, I had gained confidence in myself that my peers in my school didn't have. And I, things would happen and I would, they would stop other people. I would go, no, we can push the car out of the ditch. Let's say we, we can do this. We can make that happen because I had been in all those challenging situations that summer. When I was 19, I got my pilot's license and I don't fly anymore, but I flew for about six or seven years and I had four or 500 hours of flight time. So I, I had a fair amount of time in the air, very successful as a pilot, very, never had any close, real close calls and any really safety in, incidences because I followed all the protocols, but I had learned how to do multiple multiple tasking and navigating and understand weather and understand avionics and work with the, you know, the FAA and all the communication you have to do and fly into complex airports. And I learned all those things and I don't learn great. I don't say I don't learn great. School's not my idea of a great incubator for teaching, but flying was a fantastic place because I got to learn something. I got to apply it. I had a one-on-one -on -one instruction and I truly succeed or excelled in that area. And there have been so many things I've tied into in my life that I went, you know, I don't know if I can do this. And I scratch my head and I go, you know, exploitive, exploitive, exploitive. I, I can fly an airplane. I can do this. And it gave me the confidence I could learn complicated things. That was something I never expected to get out of flying. And I've had a number of those experiences. And Toastmasters is the same thing. When I came into Toastmasters, I wasn't looking to be the CEO of the one of the most successful clubs in Toastmasters. And for those of you that are that haven't been around for 30 years, Toastmasters used to have a distinguished club program that ranked all the clubs internationally. And it was uh, you got points for everything you did. I really loved that program. And I forgot to open the talk with this. Two things about me. I'm not politically correct. So I say things that maybe are not uh, totally in line with the Toastmasters International viewpoint. <laughs> and I don't pull my punches. I, I really feel if we're going to solve problems, we need to be able to identify the problem and talk about it. And we have a lot of problems in Toastmasters. And I see a lot of people don't want to necessarily talk about those problems. And I talk about them. And you know, just uh, you like to have a story with every example you give. When I, it was 11 years ago, now, nine years ago, I went in the hospital with severe right side pain. And I, I haven't been to the hospital in years. And we went in and they checked and they, everything seemed okay, but my right side hooked, so, to, so they took my appendix out. And that wasn't the problem. Now, <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm a little attached to my organs. So I don't like people yanking organs out of my body just on a whim. And it was, it was, it, it wound up maxing out my insurance. I had three weeks or six weeks of recovery. I had all sorts of stuff. It turned out I had a spastic iliopsoas muscle in my coming up in my back and a pain, couple of painkillers. I would have been fine in two days, but that was just an example of a wrong diagnosis of a problem. So when we look at, look at Toastmasters or look at life, let's get the right diagnosis of the problem. So some things that I learned in my Toastmasters experience, I just want to let you know that when I came in and started working on my leadership skills, started developing my communication skills, and I, I started to develop that competency in me, my career opportunities changed. I got, I got opportunities to be a department head or to be a division head of a company, and I've worked up now to, and this is my own business, but I have three partners in it. I've started been part of teams that have started over five businesses. I've been brought into companies and I've done over six turnarounds in companies. And I've learned how to get people to work on a team and get people to work together. And people don't understand that, but most of those skills I learned was in building a club to a number four club in the world. We had to get everybody on the same page and everybody winning. And just part of that experience, that was not a situation where two or three of us said, we're gonna be a championship club. That was a situation where everybody in the club wanted to be a championship club. Everybody in the club wanted to be a top 10 club. Now, those of you that are here, let me ask you a question. How many of you have been vice president of education in your club? Okay, so we're coming into May. In May, and you can't tell me this right now, but I, if we have live seminars, this is what I say. What happens in May when you're VPE? You're begging people to finish a couple speeches so you can get your DCP points in, so you can get your edge. You're begging them. And people go, they always have this nasal tone. They go, I don't know if I want to do it that fast. I, 
I don't, don't want to be pushed. I want to do it when I want to do it. Now, me, I have a tendency to just take those people out in the street and shoot them, okay? It's an American thing. I say those things in Australia and New Zealand. They go, it's an American thing, guys. Don't worry. Now, I, the point is, we're here in this club. Let's, let's actually move through the club, move through the educations. Here's what happened to my club for the, about three years, because we didn't become a number four club. Or it took us five years to get there. The members of the club were calling the vice president of education going, you haven't given me enough speaking slots to finish my CC. I'm not going to be responsible for this club not being a top 10 club. You find me speaking slots. The members of the club were demanding to complete their education so the club won. And I have never seen that before in a Toastmasters environment. There's usually three or four people in the club that are the really the stalwart, you know, dedicated members and they're trying to keep all the cats in the bag and it was really an incredible experience to get 95 people working to get through their education completions and actually achieve the points we needed to be a top a top club in the world so let me tell you a little bit of the story i want to share a couple of things that i've that i've learned along the way but the the biggest thing i want to share with you is the attitude of of running a toastmasters club i can give you all sorts of technical components on how to set the club up and Toastmasters gives us all sorts of tools. But what I learned is, first of all, Toastmasters International does not know how to correctly teach us to run a successful club. Now, that may be blasphemy some way, but just look at the statistics. Over 50% of our clubs are under 20 members and over 50% of the clubs have been under 20 members since I've been in Toastmasters. Okay? And so we have a we have a huge turnover of people in Toastmasters. We have a we lose about forty percent of our membership every year. We lost a lot, lot more with that with COVID, on that. But we typically turn about forty percent, thirty five to forty percent of our membership over. I had ninety five members. I had to get in thirty five new members a year to keep that club up at that level, because that was that we were losing about a third of our membership every year. That's how it just sort of how it works. That's that's part of the nature of the game. But one of the things that we did in the club is that. At the time, it turned out to be a really blessed, real blessing. My district is not the district I'm in right now. We've, we've, the district's moved. But my district was actually one of the worst districts in Toastmasters. And so uh, we went to the, the district training, and it was like, well, where'd they find these people? <laughs> and we came home. I've been taught to do a lot of things. I, well, I don't know how to run my club now. And so we took this viewpoint of, Let's figure it out for ourselves. And that is probably one of the biggest things I've gotten out of Toastmasters is the viewpoint of let's figure it out for ourselves. And th th this is what I've seen with, this happened to me to a lesser degree than a lot of other people, but it, I see this happen with people coming into Toastmasters. Actually, I see this with people in life. <laughs> Let me just ask you, did anybody here grow up in a family? Were you a child one time? Okay, we got a couple of kids, that's good. You know, you didn't beam me in here from another planet as an adult. So when we're kids, we have this tremendous amount of free will and energy. And there's these big people in our life. They're called parents. <laughs> and did your parents ever tell you to sit there and be quiet? Okay. One of the things the parents do is they, you know, they, they teach us, they so help socialize us. And one of those things is teaching us to sit there and be quiet. And there was a point in my life, I remember where I got ready to say something and I looked at my parents and I went, wonder what would they do or say if I said that? I don't know if that happened to you, but I, I think it's happened to most of us. And here's the question. At that moment, who became the author of our thoughts and actions? Us or our parents? To a certain degree, I started turning over the authorship of my thoughts and actions to the authorities, which the root word of authority is author. Root, excuse me, root, root of author is authority. I had it right, right. Root word of authority is author to my parents. Then I went to school and I was taught if you sit in the right seat at the right time and you sit there and do what the big people say, we'll let you succeed and go to the next grade. And after 16 years of school, that includes college. I didn't flunk four classes going through elementary and high school, just so you know. Uh, I learned to figure out and study what other people figured out. Never in school was I taught to figure something out for myself. I always studied what other people figured out. And what I learned, if I showed up in the seat at the right time and sat there, 
and didn't speak out in class, which my seventh grade I spent in the hallway doing table topics with the principal. But if I didn't speak out in class, I got to go to the next grade. Then I got a job and then I had a little different because I was in my family. But when I got when I got out in the world and started getting jobs outside my family, it was like, here's your desk, sit here, don't rock the boat. They didn't really say that, but it was said, don't rock the boat. And if we like you, sometime we'll promote you. And what happens is I did it in the business world. I didn't do it in my adventure world, but I did it in the business world. You start turning over your future, your success to the authorities, waiting for someone to give you permission to succeed. And I watch people walk into Toastmasters all the time, willing to come to the club and sit in the seat at the right time. But the truth of the matter is that your club will not succeed by everybody showing up and sitting in the seat. You got to take ownership of the club and you got to run it. And you got to start figuring things out for yourself on how to make your club work. And what happened with my club is I joined and I thought the people ahead of me were more advanced than I was. So when I came in, I was going to learn from them. So when in the, those early years, when there was a problem in the club, I didn't go, I got to solve that problem because I, there's somebody ahead of me. There's somebody more senior to me. And I'd been conditioned that the senior people solve the problems and I'm the junior person. The problem was the people that were ahead of me were looking at the senior people ahead of them. And we had a condition that I call an SEP, which that is when there was a problem in the club, it was somebody else's problem. And I don't know if you've ever read Douglas Adams' guy, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, but that's where I got that from, just so that I don't plagiarize too much in this talk. The thing that we did in my club, and I'm going to tell you a short story on that, is we no longer looked at problems as somebody else's problem. When I joined the club, we had 35 members in the club. Six months later, we had 12 coming to a meeting. Now, does that sound familiar to anybody, or is that just my club? Okay. And one day, five of us showed up. And we have a weekend club. We showed up nine o'clock in the morning and we had coffee. <laughs> and we're sitting there drinking coffee going, are we going to keep the club? We're going to close the club. The club was three years old. We're going to keep it or close it. And to summarize, here's what happened in that meeting. One, we were the five most dedicated members, the five most enthusiastic members. How do I know? We were the five that showed up that day. <laughs> and one guy says, well, if we're going to do Toastmasters, let's win with Toastmasters, but I don't want to sit here. And he didn't say this, but I'm going to paraphrase it. And I don't want to run a hospice Toastmasters club. You know, hospice Toastmasters, that's where we keep the members comfortable until the club dies. Okay. And there's a lot of clubs out there like that. And somebody else said, well, they have this, this program that they give you points and they rank you internationally. We didn't even, we'd never read the DCP. And, and, and somebody goes, well, let's be a top 10 club. And we all got excited about being a top 10 club. We said that would be winning with Toastmasters. That'd be cool. Now, the thing we did when I, I, I do all sorts of leadership training, we set a goal for the club that day at coffee. We set a goal to be a top 10 club. We wanted to go someplace with our club. Now, the membership wasn't on board with us. So what we did, we took that day, we took the roster, we divided up all the names. We, I think we each had to call five or six people and we came up with a couple questions, but the, the key question we ask everybody, now I'm gonna tell you, there's no, there's no direction in a Toastmasters manual that says your club's failing, take a, divide up the names, call every member and ask them what did they enjoy about coming to the club? But that was the question we asked because they weren't coming to the club. They said, what did you enjoy about coming to the club? And then we got back together and tallied our answers. The number one reason, and I, I like this one when we're live because I can ask you, and 90, 99% of people get it wrong. The number one reason people like coming to the club, most people say to improve their speaking skills, be a better leader. No, they wanted to have fun. That was the number one reason they wanted to come to the club. The number two reason they wanted to come to the club, they wanted to see their friends. Now, just think about it. Do you like the members of your club? The members of my club I'm closer to than most of my family today because I'm spread all over. And I'm also, I've been, to, I've been with them longer than I was that 108 kids I went to high school with. Yeah, I love my Toastmaster friends. I love seeing my friends every meeting and the meetings are need to be fun. The third reason was the personal improvement. And when we saw fun and friendly were the first two reasons that people love coming to Toastmasters, we realized why our club was failing. For two years, we'd had two presidents that were 
not fun and friendly. One person was real draconian and authoritative, and he told every they started every meeting off with "We're not making the grade, and we're all going to hell in a handbasket." And he started changing rules. He started fining people for being late to the meeting. I mean, if you were one minute late, you got a two minute fine. He'd walk in and he'd gavel down and go two dollars when you came in the meeting. Wasn't fun, okay? People, people just go, "I'm out of here," okay? So we 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 started writing our own policy. And we wrote, how do we run our club? The number one policy we have in our club is to have a fun and friendly, we have to maintain a fun, friendly environment. And we watch that. We've watched that for 25 years now. Actually, it's longer than that. It's almost 30, 29 years we've been watching a fun, friendly environment in our club. And then we did this other amazing thing. So one of the things I, I just, just gone over, I said the People come and sit in the club and they don't take ownership for the club. I'm going to give you what I've seen is the three reasons clubs fail. The number one reason that clubs fail is nobody owns the club. And what I mean by that is that people are president for a year and then they sort of like, okay, somebody else is running it and I'm not doing it anymore. Nobody really owns the club. When you have a business, somebody owns the business and there's a problem, it gets solved or the business goes out of business. And so we have a group, we put together what's called a past president's council in my club. And once you've been president, you're responsible to see the successful actions of the club stay in. Now, just so you know, my club is not 95 members anymore. We're about 35 right now. Still a strong club. We're trying to get up back up to 45. And we're working on that. And, but we were uh, over 80 members for a good 10 or 12 years. And what happened in the club was Myself, a lot of the people that have built the club up, I'm a world champion. I'm going all over the world. I'm not there running the club every, every week. The membership started to experience the success of the club, and they, they sort of let off the drive we had to keep that club big, and it went into this decline. And clubs have a life of their own from that standpoint. Then the lot of us that have built it up, we came back in, and we built the club back up. And also Toastmasters changed the Distinguished Club Program. And we never, we no longer got rewarded for being a big successful club. And I don't, I'm not a big fan of the, the current DCP program, but I will say there's no reason that every club's not President's Distinguished because it's a really low bar and everybody, every club should be President's Distinguished, but it doesn't build championship excellent clubs. It gives everybody a gold medal for running a 30 minute mile in the Olympics. It's, it's a low bar. You can do it with a walker or a wheelchair. So, but that's what I say. You should still be present. It's distinguished. So the number two reason people, clubs fail. This is what turned my club around. We went back to the membership and, and we, we wanted to get points. So we said, we got points every time somebody completed an educational level. So we went to every member and we asked them to complete an educational level every year. And a lot of people were taking three years to do their CC back then. And we got everybody on board doing that. Some people didn't want to do it. We didn't push them. It wasn't a requirement. It was a request, fun and friendly. And what we saw was as people started to do it, the energy in the club started to come up. And here's what I witnessed. This was a total surprise to me. When we got people speaking frequently in the club, their life started to change because they started keeping the gain they got from each speech and they started to improve. Now I compare Toastmasters a lot to, a to, to an exercise program. And we've all, I'm sure everybody here at one point in your life decided I'm gonna start exercising. And so maybe you joined the gym and you went to the gym the first day. How do you feel the next day? You're sore. It's just like you gave your icebreaker. How did you feel? I was nervous, right? Because speaking's like a muscle and it's weak. So if you go to the gym and you go, I'm so sore, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go back to the gym for six months. How are you going to feel six months from now? You're going to be sore again because you just lost all the gain you got for going to the gym from one day. You know, if you're going to go to the gym, you got to go three days a week. And after about three weeks, you're hopefully through your soreness and you're starting to feel your muscles coming in. You're feeling better. The same thing happened in my Toastmasters club. As people started speaking frequently, they started keeping the gain on all their speeches and they started getting better and their life changed. They got more confident. They got more competent as a speaker. They got what I call the twinkle in the eye. They got the spring in the step. They were excited to come in. We would watch them on stage transform and come alive. And at that point, they started dragging members into the club because they had experienced their life changing and improving because of Toastmasters. So the second reason I feel clubs fail that I've experienced is you don't do the program. 
people get in it and then they don't do it and they go, I don't get anything out of it. It's like I had a friend of mine who was trying to lose 50 pounds about five years ago and he joined Weight Watchers. And he didn't lose any weight. He knew that program didn't work. I saw him about two months ago and he lost the 50 pounds. I said, you look great. What are you doing? Because I joined Weight Watchers. I said, I thought that didn't work. He goes, oh no, this time I did the program. <laughs> what he did last, he went to the meetings last time. He didn't change his eating habits, okay? Well, same thing. You come into Toastmasters and you do the program. And the third reason, which I'm not going to get into in a real big way on this, um, on this talk, but the third reason that clubs fail is that they don't promote. And I'm not saying they don't promote effectively. They just don't promote. I really feel if you just ask people to come to your club and you're just persistent and consistent at it, you'll get members in. But one of the critical things about building a club is having something worth joining. You know, I always say, if you, get, if you got a flyer for like a, a new restaurant in the mail and you, and you went down to the restaurant and the food was bad, the dishes were dirty and the service was poor, would you go to back to that restaurant? No, you're not going back. It wasn't a good experience. So that's why I'm saying owning the club and getting people doing the program starts to create that membership base and that, that, that attitude of improvement in Toastmasters. And it gets your membership. Actually, people are excited. They're, they're challenging themselves in the club to to, to move themselves outside their own personal comfort zone. And when, when members come, there's an, there's an energy in the club that they want to join something like that. And that's what I experienced in, in our club across the board. Now, there were a lot of things that we learned, a lot of things we did. I wanna, I wanna share some soft skills that I realized I got out of Toastmasters that a lot of people, I see a lot of people don't necessarily see. And let's see. Okay, there we go. So that's going to do me. There we go. I'm going to, I'm going to pull my screen up here for a second. So Toastmasters Personal Development, there's no other organization I know in the world that delivers this. And the beauty of the Toastmasters program is the way we deliver it is not spoon feeding you. We just throw you in the pool and you get to learn to swim. So the first thing is we have communication soft skills we learn. We learn this through prepared speeches, but I'll tell you, even as a world champion speaker, and having done over 5,000 talks all over the world, I probably gained as much learning to be effective at table topics. And, or I'll say learning to be effective at table topics helped me in my career as much as being a, a prepared speaker. Because learning to answer an unexpected question competently <laughs> has saved my skin more times than I can count. And that's in meetings, you get tossed, you know, your area is not doing well, or somebody it sort of attacks you out of the blue, and you're able to think on your feet and handle it. That skill has been a, a critical skill. You, uh, by being Toastmaster, you develop your, to your communication skills because you're running a meeting and you're having to adjust to what's going on. And then all your listening skills, those are communication skills. We learn to listen in Toastmasters. We start by being awe counter. You know, we never heard an awe until we were awe counter, you know, and now we get whiplash every time we hear one. Being grammarian, being a, being a really good speech coach. And in my club, we call it coaching. We don't call it speech evaluation because the idea is to coach somebody to be more competent. I can evaluate you and tell you your, you know, your hair is messed up and you're overweight. And, you know, I didn't do you any good, but I evaluated you. And you know, nobody hires an executive coach or an, nobody hires an executive evaluator, an executive or a speaking evaluator. So we, our communication skills, and we see people come alive in Toastmasters doing this. I know we've all seen this. I would say Toastmasters is a little bit like church. We revive the dead. You know what I mean? People come in under this huddled shell of the mass, and six months later, we can't shut them up. <laughs> they're, they're more alive than we've ever seen. But these skills have changed my, my professional career, my corporate career. Because I can stand up in front of a room and talk. I can lead. I have the confidence. I have the personality. I have the, the competence to stand up there and not question myself and know what I'm doing and look at the audience and not be stuck in my head trying to remember what speech did I write last night that I was going to tell to everybody today. You know, the, the, the next area is that area of coaching. And this is one of the areas I think we overlook. I don't hear a lot about this in this, the development in Toastmasters, but I'm a... First of all, I don't think you can be a world champion speaker without being a good coach because I had to coach myself. I had to figure out how to make my speeches better, but I won the district championship three times in speech evaluation. And I did that just to prove to myself that I could do it. 
After that, I quit competing because every time I competed, I knocked somebody else out from getting that gain. But really being able to look at a speech and give somebody good feedback to help them become more competent. Now, that's really what we're learning to do. In Toastmasters, we're doing it with speech coaching. On the job, I do it in sales training or I do it with a you know, receptionist handling people coming in or I do it with a forklift driver on how to load the trucks and stuff. I'm figuring out how to make that individual more competent and I'm working with them in a positive reinforcing way that brings more out rather than how I was treated a lot, which was sort of to, a, you know, we're going to, I'm going to oppress you until you do, do a better job. You know, it's like the beatings will continue until the, the morale improves. So we learn how to be competent coaches and give people great feedback. And if you look across your life, I'm sure there's a number of people that spent time with you that made you into a better person. And those people I know to me are some of those valuable people I know. And I'm so appreciative they took the time to work with me. That's what I wanted to be to somebody else. The next area of uh, soft skill development we have is effective meeting management. When you're Toastmaster, you learn how to run a meeting. Now, most people don't like to go to meetings. They don't start on time, they don't run on time, and they don't, they don't end on time. They're, they're, they're a complete waste of time to go to a meeting. People love to come to my meetings. Why? The room's set up, agendas are at the place, chairs are straight, I'm at the door greeting them. Where'd I learn this? This is a Toastmasters meeting. I'm at the door greeting them to come in. We sit down, I run the meeting, run it on time. If somebody starts to go over, make sure we stay on time. They're in and out on time or early. And I have people all the time saying, I love coming to your meetings and we stay on point and we accomplish what we need to. I learned that in Toastmasters. I did not learn that anyplace else. General evaluator, you learn how to evaluate meetings. Every meeting I go to, I'm looking at how should it run? How could it be more effective? I'm constantly looking at how do we need to improve this meeting? Not Toastmasters meeting, rotary meetings. I'm in five nonprofit organizations. I'm in meetings all the time. The different businesses I have. Table topics master. You're running the meeting for this little tiny, tiny section in table topics. And even as a functionary, you're looking and watching how the meeting's running and you're watching how people interface. All these things are going into learning how to be effective in meeting management. And the last place is our leadership. We've, of course, learned that by club officer, being a club officer. We learned what leadership role is a Toastmaster. You have to run the meeting. That's a leadership role. You've got to run something and make sure it works out okay. General evaluator is a leadership role. You've got to evaluate that, give feedback. How could we have done, done it better? Table topics master is a leadership role. You get to run a little tiny section of the meeting. And even the function areas, they're little baby steps in leadership roles. And all this allows us to be a team member. And this is one of the things that is so lacking in society today. I, I don't want to be an old guy going, kids today, oh, the younger generation. Now, it's, it's, I see people come in, most people in their life have not experienced really being a true group member in something. And I was sharing earlier. What happened in my club is everybody got on board to win together. Everybody wanted to succeed. And in Toastmasters, we, we, we see what happens when we say, well, so a member says that they'll speak and they don't show up. Or somebody shows up not prepared, or they show up late. It ruins the meeting for everybody else. To be a team member, everybody's got to show up on time, be prepared to do the function they're going to do, and we learn how to interact and that we matter. And that if I don't show up, my group is going to suffer. And that is a very important skill to take out into the world for us. So this is uh, the summary. I, 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 mean, I got some other things. The game. Let me go over the game real quick. Uh, this is some stuff I figured out, and then we'll go into some Q&A. And I'd love to hear what you guys have to ask. Every game has a beginning and an end. And I'm going to move through this relatively, I like to take about 30 minutes and go through this section. But um, the Toastmasters game, when I got in, I was going, I didn't, I just joined Toastmasters. I didn't, I didn't look at it as a game. But when we wanted to be a top 10 club, we had to play the Toastmasters game. And the Toastmasters game runs from July 1st to June 30th. It's a one-year game. And it comprised of two things primarily. It is comprised of members in the club and members through their education completions. Now, these are the old education completions. I haven't changed my program, but this is really the, the essence of running a club. Members in, members trained. That's the focus. Members in, members trained. New people in, get them through their education program. All the management 
goes around members in members train members in members train because you get people in the club new people and if you if we get them to do the program their life changes they become more competent they become more confident they get the twinkle in the eye they get spring in the step they get excited about what they're learning they bring more people to the club it's really not any more difficult than that a couple things on the team structure um this is one of the things I figured out with my club. One of the problems we have in Toastmasters is that we go to district training and we put all the officers in a different room and train them and we send them back home to work together. We never teach them how to work together. You know? Now, I understand you don't have a football team and I'm really sorry about that. <clears throat> but how well would a football team play? Those of you who don't know, the Rams are in LA, okay? So anyway, <laughs> um, how well would a football team play if they never played together as a team? They'd get on the field, they'd just be running around. So I had to figure out how the, how the Toastmasters team works. And one of the things I know from my other training in business, um, what business design, I can't think of the word right now, but anyway, uh, in business design is you cannot ma manage something you can't measure. You have to be able to measure it. You just think about driving your car. You can't measure or manage the speed of your car if you can't measure it on the speedometer. So I had to look at every office and say, how can I measure that office? So the first office I looked at was who, who sets up the meeting? The sergeant at arms. So let's start there. I have on hit, I put a functional meeting space and an on-time start. That means we got to start the meeting on time. And that was a critical point in turning our club around was starting our meetings on time. I'll talk about that later if you want. So we track our sergeant arms. We have a graph for every meeting. Did the meeting start on time? The box gets checked or not. He gets a point if it starts on time. She gets a point, whatever. And then is the meeting functional? Zoom's a little different, but is it meeting? Now we have who's responsible, what officer is responsible for getting guests to the meeting? And this is probably the worst trained officer position in Toastmasters is the vice president of public relations, relationship with the public. And just so you know, I gave this to Dan Rex and Sally Newhall Cohen, uh, the top two executives in Toastmasters. And Sally said, this is really a wrong title. It should be the vice president of promotion and marketing. And that gives us a different viewpoint. We promote and market the club. And I have a whole program on how to promote and market the club. But vice president of public relations, the way that I would, would manage them, and they knew if they were doing a good job, was how many guests came to the meeting. They come up with the programs to get the guests to come. The guests come to the meeting. They experienced the meeting like I did. At the end of the meeting, we say, stand up, tell us what you thought of the meeting. They go, this is the most incredible experience I've ever had. I wouldn't mind becoming a member. They go to the vice president of membership. They fill out the membership form, collect the check. They get evaluated by the number of new members in the club. The check goes to the treasurer. The treasurer banks it. He gets evaluated by accurate financials and dues collected. We just had a dues collection. The treasurer is responsible for collecting those but the whole EC is behind him if he needs it. Then it goes to the vice president of education. That the vice president of education gets evaluated by how many education completions they get that year. That's their, that's their statistic or metric they get measured by. And then the secretary keeps accurate records. And what happens is if we get this going where the new member comes in, signs in and does the program, here's where the meat is. This is the toughest position in Toastmasters, but if we get that person through that Toastmasters training and their life changes, they will bring new people in as guests and they'll go, the circular action starts to happen where we start building the club and people are winning and they're enthusiastic about the club. The last thing I wanna talk about is the president. The president to me has two primary responsibilities. It's winning members, that's people moving through their program and life changing and an expanding club. When you're president, you should have more members and more education achievement at the end of your year than the previous president had. That's the goal for you as president. Now, two things are gonna happen. You need to help your members, your officers do a good job for two reasons. One, everybody should have a positive experience being a Toastmaster officer, positive learning experience. And what I see a lot of people take the position on, they don't start doing it right away. And then it gets a, they get behind it and they start to feel guilty that they haven't done it. And then they, they, they have a hard time starting. And then like the VPPR doesn't do anything for three months. And they're like, oh, I don't know. Then they're overwhelmed by the job. That's why as president, you got to get down there and help them get started. Help them, you know, one-on-one -on -one working with them, making sure they're winning. You do that for the second reason, 
if they don't do the job, you get it. And if you want to have a horrible time as president, have six officers under your, underneath you that aren't doing their job. You got to schedule everybody. You got to set the meeting up. You got to collect the dues. You have to do everything. You're going to have a horrible time. So I learned very quickly. The reason I my, my, I'm president for the third year this year is having good teams. And the thing works like clockwork. Nobody, nobody gets overwhelmed. But if my officers aren't doing their jobs, I'm overwhelmed as a president. The other thing that happens, I'm going to end off on this point. As president, you're going to learn the strengths and weaknesses you have as a leader. And you're going to hit the wall and you're going to be confused and you're not going to know what to do. And you're going to be like me and you're going to pull all your hair out and um, got a couple smiles. Thank you. Anyway, when you hit the wall and there's a problem in the club that's going on, you need to solve the problem. Don't let it go. And what you do is you get help. You have to be willing to raise your hand and say, as president, I need some help. I don't have a solution for this. And I see a lot of people go into that president's role and think they have to have all the solutions and they're the boss. And if you want to kill a club, try to be boss as a president. <laughs> it's no longer fun and friendly to have a bossy president. Okay. So the first place you get help is inside the club. Go to your members, go to the senior members, go to your EC. Let's get together. People aren't showing up. We need new members, whatever's going on. Get together. Let's get our minds together. Let's get some ideas on the table. How can we solve this problem? Engage everybody in solving the problem. If you as a club can't solve the problem, you go outside the club. You go, and here's what I, you know, again, a lot of area directors have never even been an officer in a club before. You know, because we're usually trying to get area directors in. Sometimes they're great area directors, but I'm just going to say a lot of area directors don't know how to solve the problem in your club. For me, I would go to the top clubs in your district. I'd go to the top postmasters in your district. I would call them up and say, we're having a problem in our club. Could you talk to us? Could you come to a meeting? Could you see what we're doing? Can we come visit your club and see what's going on? But here's the point. You figure it out for yourself, but you decide to succeed with Toastmasters. And I'll, we'll leave on this point, and then let's take some Q&A. If Toastmasters was played like some of these reality TV show games are, you know, and I, I'm, not, I'm not doing this from a political standpoint, but there used to be the show The Apprentice, you know, and what they, what they would send people out on the streets of New York, and they would have to create a business. What if Toastmasters, just imagine this, if it was a game to see who could make the most successful Toastmasters club? And here's your product. You have a product that every human being needs. In, improve communication and leadership skills. Improve soft skills for success. That's your product. And the winner gets a million dollars. And the 16,000 clubs go out and go, okay, we're going to see if we can win the million dollars. Let's put our team together and see what we can do. How hard would you play the game if there was a prize at the end of the year that you could get? And I, I have submitted to TI a leader a championship, a world championship of leadership, which to me is the top 10 clubs in Toastmasters, not the top one. I think we need to reward leadership in this organization as much as we need to reward speaking. And we need, we need to have Toastmasters clubs like mine is that was up around 100 members. To me, a good club is 40 to 60 members. That's a dynamic communication and leadership environment that we're in on it and stuff. But uh, in order to do that, we as members have to pick up the ball and run with it. And your Toastmasters success, the only thing that's between it and your success and your club is the cumulative leadership and the drive that you and your members have, because there is no higher authority in your club than you. Toastmasters gives us the tools to build our club, just like Home Depot gives us the tools to build our house. But Home Depot ain't coming over and building your house. You got to swing the hammer. So with that, let's take some questions if you've got it. And I'm glad to, I, I was going to do 20 minutes. I'm sorry. I get, I get on a roll. I, I got so much I could share, but let's, uh, let, let's, let's uh, start. You want, I, I guess we'll raise hands. I guess that's what's going on. Right. David, do you have a question to start off with? Or is someone going to moderate this? How do we want to do it? I'll go ahead and moderate it. Before you, we start though, we did have a question in the chat or a statement in the chat that they would love to have a printout of your Toastmasters personal development slide oh i bet you would five five fifty a month for the rest of your month and i'll give that to you so no first of all first of all i i have to see that's a that's a powerpoint slide i have this is recorded right yes it is okay well i don't i just put that together about eight months ago when i started doing you know doing that i just put it down but um 
uh, on it. We'll see that. Let's get some questions and I'll see what I can do to get to, to copy okay. it off and send it to somebody. And I took a screenshot of it so we could okay, use it good. as a share. Okay, uh, hands up. Jackie Cam Blackard, do you have your hand up? Yes. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, I appreciated your, uh, your talk. We have a corporate club. We have about 12 members. Now, our membership is strong. However, due to work uh, responsibilities, a lot of people aren't able to devote time to their development and or to help out with leadership. I'm open to suggestions. Okay, corporate clubs, uh, we'll just talk, corporate clubs are an interesting beast. They're a little different than public clubs. They're easy to start and they're easy to fail. And for them to work, you really need to have the tie-in of the upper management or HR. You get, you, that, that they has to be backed up because if, if you, I don't know how big the company is, but if you have a manager over an area and there's some of his, his subordinates, whatever, are in a Toastmasters club and he's trying to get projects out the door and they're going, I'm going to Toastmasters today. It doesn't set very well with the manager. Okay. So the manager needs to be on board with the person getting their development, their, their development skills. A couple of things I recommend to most corporate clubs, you know, they meet during the corporation during the day, I would recommend maybe one meeting a month meeting outside, meet at somebody's house, you know, maybe in their backyard on a Saturday afternoon and have a little barbecue and give eight or nine speeches and you get people moving through their program or go to a bar on Thursday night or something, drink beer and throw peanut shells on the floor. And you get, but you do a, like a speech-a-thon, you know, where you, people speak more so that you get them moving through that program faster and you get them out of the environment. You start to create a fun environment. And then when they come back, there's a more of a camaraderie with that group because you know, you're trying to build it. The other thing I would look at doing is look at what you can deliver to the company. Um, maybe you do seminars, you tie in with HR or something and you do a seminar on how to do PowerPoints or you do a seminar on how to, do, how to prepare for a speech. You do, you do a little, little vignettes on these things. And the, so the other employees in the company can come to a learning you know, session with you that you're explaining how to put a speech together. Here's how you wanna do it you know, proper stage manners or lectern etiquette, all these little things we can teach, do little seminars on that for all the employees in the company to come. And, and so now you're a training unit for the company and that gives you leads for people coming in and wanting to, wanting to work and explain, you're like going to the gym. It's like we have a gym here in the company and we want you to come over and we want you to work out 15 minutes a day so you're healthier. We want you to come to Toastmasters an hour a week so you're healthier in your other skills. So there's just a couple ideas. We can do a deep dive on that, but I want to. Uh, we we just have a few minutes left. I want to get some other questions in here. Thank you. Um, I do not see any. Other, oh, R.J. Stratton. Yes, Lance. Thank you. It was awesome. I enjoyed your speech very much. I have a question for you because I know you're a reader. One book you could probably recommend that you probably one of the best ones you like. Endurance. Um. Ernest Shackleton, uh, Endurance by Alfred Lansing. Uh, it's not a technical book. It is a book about Ernest Shackleton going to Antarctica in 1914 to be the first Antarctic explorer to cross Antarctica. His boat gets stuck in the ice 80 miles from shore with 28 men on board. He's there for about a year and it gets crushed. He moves out on the ice with three lifeboats. They're down there for 22, 28 months or something like that. He saves all 28 men. That life, that book changed my life, but it also showed me what's capable of a group of people. And, um, you know, that it showed me what a problem was. So once I read that, I, I would think I had problems in my life and I went, I'm not stuck in the ice in Antarctica. I don't have a problem, but that there's a lot of stuff I can recommend, but that's, that's the book that that was a tipping point for me. Uh, Makeda Joseph. Hi, Lance. Thank you so much for coming. I've seen you on YouTube, so I certainly appreciate you visiting with us. <laughs> Thank you. I, I have two questions. Uh, first of all, I, well, I've been a Toastmaster since 2019. Both of my parents were Toastmasters, though, so I'm quite familiar with it. However, with this current environment, or at least what I've experienced, my first question is, how do you manage uh, speeches because 40 members, I've 
we, I don't experience, I haven't experienced that like 40 active members. So how do you manage getting speeches in there? And my second question is, uh, do you have suggestions for uh, bringing in millennial and Gen Zs and the younger folks? What would your suggestions be for that? Uh, Thank pizza you. probably on that one, but uh, <laughs> let, me, let me take the first one. First of all, we have a three hour meeting, which is a bit of an anomaly in Toastmasters. We don't have a one hour meeting or a 90 minute meeting. Uh, there's some stuff. I, there's a lot of stuff I haven't gone over with you, but even that with the three hour meeting, we have six speaking slots in that meeting. When we, we had 95 members, we had a three hour meeting. If you take the number of speaking slots times the number of meetings you have per year, which we meet once a week, which is usually 50 meetings a year, six times 50 is 300. That's 300 speaking slots you can deliver speeches in. And in the old program, which I'm much more fond of, I won't go down that rabbit hole, is we were 10 speeches per speaking level. So we could get three with 10 speeches, we could get 30 completions with 300 speaking slots. You follow the math. We had 57 the year we won. What we did, we would create speaking slots to make sure we expanded our delivery for the membership. We didn't cap our delivery based on the meeting time. Okay. And just imagine if you had a donut shop and you started selling out of donuts, what'd you do? You'd figure out a way to make more donuts. Well, we had, we were growing. We had to figure out a way to deliver to our membership. Otherwise the club would fail because the only way the club works is if the members are winning. I'll tell you what we did. We have a weekend meeting. We went to lunch afterwards. We'd have three speakers at lunch. We did, we, the second half of the year, we went to two meetings a week. We had a weekend meeting and a Wednesday night meeting. And we'd have spaghetti. We literally had the spaghetti, garlic bread, and a little salad at somebody's house. We had 18 people show up at somebody's house and speak in the living room. And that was our Wednesday night meeting. And people were like, oh, you should have been at the Wednesday night meeting. It was so exciting. I've had people go, oh, how terrible. It wasn't terrible. It was exciting. The energy was through the freaking roof. We were like, we were charging towards this goal. But that's why I was talking about the corporate club expand your speaking, expand your ability to deliver. Don't cap your training on your time. Figure out, figure it out for yourself. How can I make this work? And you start, and that, that's all we did. We go, well, how we want to be a top 10 club. How do we make this work? We have to go to two meetings a week. And just so you know, I had people in my district fighting us like crazy. People wanted to split the club, all sorts of stuff. I had to break two people's noses to get them to leave me alone. But like I said, you know, I, I told them, I said, people don't want to join a Toastmasters club. They want to join our Toastmasters club. There's a difference. You split a club, you kill both clubs. Both of them die. No, we're not splitting the club. And that what those, just so you know, what those, those district leaders at that point had an inability to form a club. And the only way to get a new club was take a successful club and kill it. So anyway. So I do have one more question that was in chat and it's in relation to corporate clubs again. The corporate club meets at lunch, which many corporate clubs do. The work-life balance has gotten out of balance <laughs> control. People are working through lunch due to time constraints or overloading of work in your career or do you have any suggestions on how to approach leadership about work-life balance? Work <laughs> are you talking to somebody who works like 11 o'clock every night and you wanna to talk to me about work-life balance? Here's, here's my recommendation for work-life balance. Do something you love so your work is your life, okay? Um, I mean, I don't wanna be sarcastic about that, but I. The happiest days of my life were leaving jobs I had, okay? Because for a long part of my life, I was doing jobs that I had to do because I had to work. And it was actually a lot of my Toastmasters experience got me into an environment where I'm actually doing things I really enjoy doing. But that being said, um, uh, let's talk about work-life balance with Toastmasters. You might, to keep your club together, I said you might need to maybe meet at some other times. The other thing is survey your members, talk to your members. Get everybody together and say, we want this to work. What's going to work for you? Would you guys want to meet? You want to meet at seven in the morning instead of at lunch? You want to, you want to meet Thursday nights? What do you want to do? Let's figure this out and get agreement with your club on what you want to do so that you can move forward instead of one person or two people sitting there trying to figure it out. And this is, to me, the, the bane of existence on planet Earth where we get a couple people in leadership positions and they go, I am your leader. You will do what I say. And I will oppress you in the process of it. That's, that's not what effective leadership, effective leadership is getting everybody on the same team. 
And that's, um, I, I have a whole program I do corporately called Leadership is Everybody's Business. And the whole idea is getting everybody on the team. I, I talk about how hard would an NFL team play if the owner was the only one that got the Super Bowl ring. You know, those, yeah. those players play because everybody on that team is winning, you know. So let, let me wrap up. I had put my website in the chat and I'm not here to sell you anything. I, I do have, I have CDs on how to promote and market your club on how to run a championship club on leadership for championship club. I got a lot of audio and video material on there. I also have free speak, uh, it's free tips cards you can get. These are four by six tips cards. You can download these. Uh, this is on speaking, this is on speech evaluation, and this is on building a championship club. And I have a weekly um, sort of a video I send out, usually on speaking tips and or whatever I want to talk about that day. <laughs> you never know what you're going to get. But I, every, every Tuesday I send out, it's, it's about a three to five minute video. Sometimes they're 10, but it's, it, depends how, it depends how ordinary I am at the time. So, uh, but I would like to stay in touch with you. So if you want to download the speaking tips or sign up for the video, and then you'll be on my mailing list and well, I'd love to stay in touch with you. And with that, I'd like to thank you and let's go out and change the world of Toastmasters. We, we need to bring people together and teach the world to teach the world to speak, you know, like the old Coke commercial. I'd like to set a saying, we can teach the world to speak. Um, Lance, I went ahead and put your, um site into the chat again so it'd be at the bottom i really appreciate you taking the time to work to work with me i know i wasn't always the best at communication but i really appreciate your patience and i would also like to give our district director um david kincaid the opportunity to close out this session thank you very much karen lance Marvelous, wonderful information, tools. We are so happy you came to join us today. You may be known as a world champion of public speaking, but I'm going to give you a new title today. You are the CLO, the Chief Leadership Evangelist of Toastmasters International. And you can wear that proudly because you've got us fired up here today. Absolutely. And you got a whole bunch of us turn our cameras on for the first time in a big meeting. <laughs> thank you so much, Lance. Welcome. And thank you, Karen, for getting him here. Everybody give yeah. it it's a big round of applause. Thank you. Guys. So, thank, you. thank you very much. Back to you, Karen. Okay. Um, so we are now in the point of our uh, program that we will have our annual business meeting at 10 o'clock. For those of you who are, are in the need to attend that meeting, please stay on, on this link. Otherwise, we will have our first educational session start.